you said, yeah, on my twig, I joined the Tesla Orchestra right after it began two years ago in 2009. So I've been there for most of the ride. So, So, that's what we're doing. We are basically a group of enthusiasts, mostly in case alumni, graduates, undergraduates. We range from people I think in a freshman year up to like there's one guy who is a who's a 30 year alumni who's now in industry. I've got rock so a lot. Uh, there are also a, at least one high school student and a couple faculty members that. Pitch in, but we're mainly a group based around case, so we're not really sanctioned by USG, we're not a club or a team or anything like that. We're kind of, you know, in the gray area. But we were founded in 2009 by Ian Charnas, this was his bringing child, and he basically started by with him and Ed Burwell bouncing ideas back and forth for how they would, they wanted to do a performance at what's called Ingenuity Festival which is the fall festival in Cleveland where it's a kind of arts technology kind of feature and their idea was musical festivals. Um, our funding comes from a few sources. A lot of it's private. You know, being the guy who, the founder of Gmail, who donated, what, 15, 18, yeah. Okay. He donated 18,000 to us for the last time. Oh, wow. Yeah, and uh, we get some, we do show fees wherever we go, mainly for self funding or nonprofit. None of us are in this sort of thing. And we perform now in Austria, Croatia. We've done two shows in Cleveland. One of them just got rained out, that would have been three. And we're hoping to do more in the future. But yeah, we perform for a thousand people. Europe loves us. Uh, we, we get out Lady Gaga. That's how we <laughs> So that's, that's in Croatia. We like to see Croatia. But just as for example of what this actually looks like, So 
I just want to say that this is not an instruction manual on how to build a Tesla coil, how to do it safely. You're not going to walk out of your experts. I'm just going to, you know, maybe pique your curiosity a bit and let you into our world a little bit. Uh, if you ever do get into this, make sure you're always with an expert, make sure you're never alone, and at least one person knows C2R, because our failure is the killer. Okay, so Tesla coil, they make lightning, but not many people know what they actually are. So, of course, they were invented by Nikola, uh, Nikola Tesla, but they weren't called that back in the day. You can kind of track the Tesla coil back to several of his patents that kind of merged into one, and you can see a diagram up on the right. And it bears pretty much a lot of resemblance to what you see nowadays. His idea was to use these things to transport energy over huge distances to the upper atmosphere with balloons and stuff. And that was ridiculous. He had a lot of ridiculous ideas. You know, he had lots of good ones too, so that's okay. But the basic definition of a Tesla coil is a resonant transformer. It uses both transformation, like you see in a wall transformer that works at 60 hertz, to step up voltage, and also uses resonance to step up voltage. It's basically just a giant resonant amplifier, if you want to put it that way. And nowadays, they don't have much practical <coughs> purpose. They never got as far as they wanted to, so they're mainly used for education and entertainment. You see them at science museums and performance arts, things like this. So to really understand the operation, you've got to go back to Circuits 101 and look at resonance systems. In circuitry, resonance systems are going to be made of inductors and capacitors. And what resonance means is really that when you excite a system at a certain frequency, it will tend to accumulate energy, or store energy, or transfer energy. And if you, say, have some energy in that system and you release it, it will tend to oscillate itself at a certain resonant frequency. So it's really just some system where at one frequency, sometimes more frequencies, it'll have the ability to store energy. So, like I said, in circuitry, we make them mostly with inductors and capacitors. And they have the basic impedance for a capacitor and inductor in st and stated in complex uh, algebra. I'm sure you'll remember that from circuits 210 or whatever. So there are a couple of ways we can build simple uh, resonant circuits. One, we can drive uh, an inductor and capacitor in parallel and with this configuration, what we find is that at a resonance frequency given by SC, that's the resonance frequency, we'll have a very high impedance. Like you can see for, on the chart on the right, I don't know if that's visible or not. Yeah, right, that's not sure. But uh, what you should be able to see is a very sharp peak in the middle. That's where the impedance of that entire tank circuit becomes pretty much infinite. Everywhere else, it starts to drop off towards zero. So this isn't very useful if you want to store that energy into something. If you drive with a voltage, it won't absorb any energy. So limited use. Series resonant is a lot more interesting. You put them in series, and the opposite happens at the resonant frequency. The impedance approaches zero. And suddenly, if you drive with a voltage into a impedance that is effectively zero at its resonant frequency, you will start to store tremendous energy in that system. It will just absorb it and absorb it until something burns. Uh, Another nice thing is that the midpoint, the, I believe the label VO, that's another circuit node that comes from that series arrangement. If you drive at a resonant frequency, that node will amplify your source voltage by a lot, depending on how good your resonance circuit is, how much resistance there is, etc. But this is a circuit that can store and amplify energy and voltage. Okay? So the other thing we have to go to is the transform. So everybody in the circuits 210 went to transformer row. You put in the current, and it outputs current divided by the terms ratio, multiplies the primary voltage. And this is you know, fun, and you take a test on it, blah, blah, blah. But no transformer actually works that way. Um, but you have to start with this. So you have a terms ratio that was defined by the secondary divided by the primary terms, L at N. And it does what it still does what they told you in Circus 210. It, do, it divides the primary current. I actually made a statement of this equation. It'll, oh no, that's just defining it. It'll step up the primary voltage if the turns ratio is high, 
and it'll step down the, the current that returns ratios. So it's basically like you knew it all along. Another thing it does is it acts as what's called an impedance transformer. If you look into the primary transformer, you will actually see whatever load is on the secondary side, and that'll be transformed by a factor of n squared. So if you put if you have a transformer that has a 1 to 10 turns ratio, and you put a 100 ohm resistor on the secondary, and you say measure impedance out on the primary, you'll see 1 ohm. It'll actually appear as a 1 ohm resistor. It isn't a 1 ohm resistor, but it does have impedance transformation. That's very useful for trying to build resonance uh, circuits. So the first thing we add onto this really uh, idealized transform model is magnetizing inductance. So, uh, in an ideal transformer, you don't actually produce any magnetic field in the windings, but in a real transformer, you do. You have some finite inductance that draws current, and you call that magnetizing inductance because it actually causes a magnetic field between the windings. And that'll kind of, it'll absorb current, even if there's no load on the secondary, you drive with a voltage, you'll see the LM, the magnetizing inductance, has a look. So there's that. But that's simple. The more complicated thing is the leakage inductance. So when you have uh, windings that are not perfectly coupled to each other, some of the flux from one winding doesn't all go into the secondary. Some of it leaks out. That's called leakage flux, and it gives rise to leakage inductance. It's part of the flux you're generating on one winding, not making it to the other, and it manifests itself as just kind of a series uh, inductance on both the primary and secondary. It's leakage on both sides. And we characterize this leakage and the coupling with a coupling coefficient called K. And it's between 0 and 1. 0 meaning no flux is coupled between the windings. 1 meaning you have perfect coupling between them. And therefore, there's no leakage inductance. So right now, we, this is, if you take any two windings, and put them in some geometry, you'll get an equivalent model that can be completely described by all these parameters, except for things like resistance or whatever. And we're also working only with air core transformers, so no non-linearities with iron or whatever. Okay, so if we add on capacitors to that loosely coupled <coughs> transformer, you'll end up with a double resonance system. That's what people call it. So if we go back, you see that you have an ideal transformer in the middle with the magnetizing inductance, and then you have some uncoupled inductance, uncoupled inductance. And what we're going to do is add capacitance here to resonate with the primary leakage, and capacitance here to resonate with the secondary leakage. So we're going to have two resonance circuits that are coupled to each other, and something kind of weird happens. You kind of expect that if those two resonance circuits uh, have the same resonant frequency and you couple them together, you get a big super resonant peak, you know, it'd be great. You would drive it and it would just amplify more and more. But when you couple things together, something weird happens and you get what's called a peak split. And you can see it in the bottom figure, again, it's red, I apologize that. What we actually see is kind of, <coughs> this is the, if you drive the input with a voltage and then the second has a little bit better. If you drive the primary, resonance circuit with a voltage, and if you look at the output secondary voltage, you'll see that this is where the original resonant frequency was of each circuit before being coupled, but you actually end up with this peak shape. And the splitting between those peaks is directly related to your coupling coefficient. The more you couple together, the farther those peaks split apart. And that's actually kind of the schematic of the Tesla coil. I have to tell you more about how this, how those capacitance actually manifest themselves. You go back on the primary side, have like a 0.95 microfarad capacitor. That's just a capacitor that you can hold everything. But on the secondary, you have a tiny capacitor, 82 picofarads, and that's actually just either made from the parasitic capacitance of your secondary coil, and you can also add on the top load. And the top load has two uh, important purposes. First and foremost, if you add a nice rounded top load, then the end of that secondary will withstand higher voltages before breaking out into a corona or an arc, basically before it releases its energy into the air. And that's very desirable if you want to draw out a long spark. You want to hold off that spark as long as you can 
So having a nice round surface like a steer is great. It's all about the radius of curvature. And if, like you think about a lightning rod, those attract lightning because they're sharp. Their electric field is strong at the point. And this is the exact opposite. And actually Tesla like, came up with a top load idea as kind of a counter to lightning rod. He patented uh, this, I think, like 1897. It was something to deflect lightning. You cover your house with a giant dome of metal. That was an idea. And it would probably would work. It would hit pointy things and avoid you. So this is the idea. And also it can increase your uh, effective secondary capacitance. It kind of lumps into the self-capacitance of your secondary coil. So uh, like I said, you want to prevent breakout from happening, but it needs to happen somewhere. You generally want to control where that happens. So people will actually add what's called a breakout point to the top load. You can see that in the bottom photo that someone has actually more of a kind of donut shape. It's called a torus or a toroid. And they've actually added a little point to the top. And that's so when a breakout does happen, it happens up, not out. It's predictable, it's safe. Okay, so that's just an, another method of control is putting a breakout point. So we have this kind of coupled resonance system. It can amplify energy, has lots of gain and stuff. But the issue comes up is if we're in, you know, the 1900s, the vacuum tube hasn't really even matured yet. How do you excite this system at, you know, hundreds of kilohertz when all you got is, you know, 60 hertz coming out of the wall? It just doesn't work. You can't directly drive it like that. And back then, the only way you can switch a circuit reliably is with this, another spark. So the first Tesla coil needed a lot of Tesla coils now are based on spark gap technology. What a spark gap is is really just a couple of electrodes that are shaped a certain way, they're spaced a certain distance from each other, so that when a certain voltage occurs between that, you'll get a spark between them. And when that spark happens, that spark will become pretty much a short circuit to that high voltage uh, potential. And that uh, short will persist until the current falls off to zero. So it's kind of like a latching switch. It'll, once you build a measuring, it'll close hard, and then it'll close until there's nothing left to go through until the next time it comes back up. So this is the way you could trigger a Tesla coil back in the day. So this is a really bare bones schematic of a spark gap Tesla coil. So what you have on uh, the input is you have some supply. It could be 60 or 50 hertz AC, and probably 120 or 240 volts, whatever, you know, plus something you pull out the wall. Then you need to get at least enough voltage to fire spark gap. It takes like, you know, a few thousand volts to break down air. So what you do is you put it through a 60 hertz uh, step-up transformer like you find in a neon sign. Those are really popular with amateurs. Get a neon sign and you get out the transformer and that's actually the hardest piece to get of a Tesla coil. So that will step it up to say, you know, 5,000 volts RMS on the second. Still at 60 hertz though, you can't resonate the coil with that. But what you do is you put your primary capacitor on the other side of the spark gap. So what happens when the 60 hertz signal starts to come up on the secondary of that transformer is that capacitor will start to charge. Up to, you know, it'll get close to 5,000 volts or something. And that voltage will be seen as across a spark gap. So that spark gap is getting ready to trigger and there's energy stored in that primary capacitor. And right now, I got these, these pictures from someone else who runs this site. This inductor popped up in the middle. It's his mistake, I think. But this inductor is important so that when this fires for a very short period of time, you're not just shorting out the AC line and, you know, tripping fuses and blowing stuff up. This basically is like a low-pass filter. That's it, and, uh, along with the line filter before the transformer. So right now, energy is accumulating the primary capacitor, and we're building up uh, voltage on our spark gap. So at some point, the spark gap, gap should fire. At that point, we created a short circuit here and a closed loop for current to flow. So we went from just having energy in the capacitor, but now we have a path that's just <coughs> with this resonant circuit, so it will start to oscillate at its own natural frequency. Even though there's still 60 hertz going on up here, this short pretty much cuts the circuit in half, that nothing goes past that short circuit because of this big inductor here. So now this primary circuit is oscillating freely at its resonant frequency. 
So if things are tuned right, if the secondary is tuned to the same frequency as the primary, you'll start to couple energy through that loosely coupled transformer for the secondary. And its voltage will start to rise, and you might get a corona if you're lucky, or a spark, or whatever. And you actually see something kind of interesting. Uh, these are simulated waveforms that you'll see in real Tesla coils. What, in detail, what you're seeing up here is the primary capacitor voltage and the secondary top load voltage. So notice the scale, 20 kilovolts, 700 kilovolts. That's totally reasonable. Um, and what you see here is that at the start, if we have lots of energy in our primary circuit, we'll start with no energy on the secondary circuit, and it'll kind of transfer over from the primary to the secondary, and you'll get this peak, and it'll notch, and you'll get a peak in the other one. So energy is kind of sloshing back and forth between the primary and the secondary resonance circuits, and it's oscillating at the same time. So this is all happening at around 30 kilohertz. And the neat thing is that if you look back at that graph with that peak splitting, you'll actually see that that frequency at which that beating, that exchange happens, is this delta F. It's exactly that. You'll actually see that if you do the FFT of this waveform, you'll get that spectrum. So, cool networks. So this happens until your energy is gone. Remember, you start out with just a finite amount of energy in that capacitor, 20 kilovolts, and it goes back and forth until it's lost in the corona and the spark gap and the resistance of your coils, and it'll die out and your uh, spark gap will eventually extinguish itself. And then you wait for the next 60 hertz cycle to fire it again. And that's why spark gap test coils, at least stationary spark gap test coils, will fire at six, uh, 60 hertz when they need that kind of sound. The thing is, uh, since spark gaps are incredibly robust, they're still the most powerful test of coils that exist. It's hard to break a piece of metal, but they do. Okay, so moving on to the 21st century, or 20th century, actually. So people want to modernize the test of coils, spark gaps, yeah, but we don't want to be able to control these things a little bit with silicon, if possible. So we need to kind of switch that doesn't latch like this spark gap. The latching switch sucks because when you turn it on, you can't turn it off. You lose control. So you want something like a transistor, an IGBT, a MOSFET, a BJT, something that you can drive at the resonant frequency. So fast, kind of hard to do, it, especially at these power levels, you know, 20 kilohertz to 2 megahertz, sometimes even higher frequencies. But people have found ways. So, one of the simplest ways to drive a Tesla coil is with a circuit that's called an H-bridge. And this is really popular with driving motors, which is why I grabbed this image from Wikipedia of them driving a motor. So this is a kind of a block diagram, not using actual circuit components. What you have is a load in the middle, be it a motor or a coil or whatever, and you have four switches connecting kind of an H shape and you have just a DC voltage source over here. So what you want to do is drive this load with either the positive voltage source or the negative voltage source. And you can switch in between them by controlling these switches. Like in here, if these two switches opposite from each other are closed, you'll see the voltage applied positive and negative. If you open those switches and then close the other ones, close, close, open, open, you'll see the voltage applied in the opposite direction. So you basically can get a rectangular wave across your load right here. And when you see these circuits, they're in modern circuits, they're going to be MOSFETs or IGBTs. So the first attempts people that had at using solid state technology for driving coils was the solid state Tesla coil. People like acronyms because they get kind of long, SSTC. And in this, it's actually different from the uh, spark gap Tesla coil. You don't have a primary capacitor uh, that's resonating with your primary coil. So this is kind of a single resonance system. You just have one LC combination and then some leakage and magnetizing inductance, which doesn't do much. But this is driven with an H bridge, and they'll generally have some kind of feedback method that looks at this, the uh, electric field produced by the top load or the current in the secondary that you use to kind of make a self-oscillating system. Like you just basically throw a couple flip-flops and a current transformer and antenna together 
and you'll actually have something that can oscillate itself. So this produces waveforms like this. So what you're seeing here on the bottom, you're seeing primary waveforms. Green is going to be the primary current, and pink is going to be the primary voltage. So again, the so the H bridge can only output a square wave sort. On the top, you see blue is going to be secondary voltage. Uh, gray is going to be, yeah, secondary current. So you'll notice that the primary current is kind of spiky, and that's because you're driving an inductor directly. Like you guys know what should happen to an inductor current when you draw with a square wave. You'll integrate the square wave and you get a triangle. That's what we're seeing here. And also to superimpose that is going to be the secondary current reflected by the turns ratio of our transform. So you'll see it's kind of like uh, up towards the end, you'll try to kind of take on a stock shape. So this is okay. it will just drive it until the output amplitude reaches steady state, which is just defined by, you know, if you draw a spark, it'll kind of level off, or if you have lots of resistance, it'll level off. But this uh, circuit can drive forever, and it'll just keep building up energy until it goes into steady state. This is called continuous mode or continuous wave operation. So people were happy uh, with this for a while. They make like one foot sparks with a kilowatt in, you know, yay, and they were playing music with them because since it's all solid state, you can just turn the thing on and off. You can just say oscillate, don't oscillate, oscillate, don't oscillate, and do that at that audio frequency and it makes sound. You know, people were cool. But some people weren't happy enough and they did something really simple but ingenious and they added that primary capacitor back then. Um, and what this does is it kind of cancels out that primary inductance that's causing that triangular waveform. So now you have a double resonance system again. And this gives you some pretty huge advantages. Like you know how uh, I said that with this uh, series resonance circuit, it can drop the impedance to zero. Well, that's what this does. Your primary impedance effectively goes to zero and you start driving insane amounts of current into that if you're not controlling it well. So this is kind of giving you as an impedance matching or and canceling, but it's kind of more fun than that. This is the kind of waveform you get. It looks a lot like what you see in spark yet. That's the quote we have on the bottom. The primary current is green, voltage is in teal or gray. So it's kind of going up, and as as we go up, we kind of go down and head a notch as the secondary energy hits a peak. So we still have this kind of back and forth. Kind of motion. This is what a lot of people call a burst mode operation, where you kind of deliver energy back and forth <coughs> in transient events. And one key difference that's really, really nice about this uh, type of drive is that if you notice here, the primary waveforms, you see zero current at the same time as zero volts. You can't see the numbers, but this is zero on both axes. And when you have that zero current switching, it's so much easier on your switching devices as opposed to if you go uh, back here and you see that during the edges of the H bridge where it's transitioning, you got, you know, 25 amps or whatever, negative 20 amps. That puts a lot of stress on your MOSFETs or IGBTs to switch, you know, a few hundred volts while they're conducting 100 amps or so. Heats them up. But that's not a problem with the dual resonant coil as long as you tune it correctly. This is this has to kind of be tweaked around to get this kind of behavior. But it allows you to basically get a factor of 10 out in power more because you've lowered the impedance of your primary circuit and you've also increased its efficiency by this uh, zero current switching behavior. So this is great. Um, just so you know, this you can observe these waveforms in real life. This is a simulation. This is taking those pram uh, this is taking parameters from this coil. This is one of our coils run at medium power. Try to see green is primary current, yellow is secondary current, and you can see pretty much the exact same shape. It's a little scale, the time axis and the voltage or whatever are a little different, but you see the primary current feeding and the secondary current peaking at the same time. And we do this, we only run it for one of these cycles. If we kept running the H bridge, we would see that the primary current would come like this and it would peak again and we could get you know, continuous peaks on the secondary and primary more energy transfer. We generally limit it to one very high energy peak and then shut it off. And that's 
why it's easy to make music because this guy, in a very short amount of time, can go up to ridiculously high voltage. I think I simulated this with like something like a 50 volt DC bus, whereas you normally use like 500 volts. So you get you know almost 200 kilovolts on the top load, and this is just kind of turning the self-oscillating system on and off at 300 hertz. So this is the top load voltage you get. And the thing is, anything that expands air, anything that creates sound waves, if you can control this repetition right, you'll make music. Like, do you have it with motors, it happens in your car, in your washing machine, anything that has periodic behavior and, you know, stuff up, will make music. And arcs are no different. They heat the air, it expands violently. Um, it doesn't sound like a bell, but you can definitely make tones out of it just by repeating this burst of energy. So this is fundamentally different from, again, the normal solid state Tesla coil where you kind of continuously drive it, reach steady state. Here you're kind of doing discrete packets of energy back and forth from the primary to the secondary. And in that brief moment, you know, hundreds of microseconds, you get one loud bang. So enough about the theory, enough about the diagrams. We'll talk about power coils a bit. So power coils, we, as far as we know, they're the largest, most powerful twin solid state Tesla coils in the world. As far as I know, no one's tried, I've looked, I've not seen anyone who can threaten that claim. Um, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. I know. I'm on the watch. <laughs> um, they better watch out. Uh, so I actually kind of kind of BS is number 14 feet. I forget when we changed the top load, we got a little bit shorter. You're on that order. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you can see Ian standing there in his costume for scale. He's a little taller. Yeah, 14 feet sounds right. And they produce arcs around 13 feet long normally, though we've seen, like, it's hard to measure the freak strikes that will reach out and hit the bottom of the other coil, which, you know, eyeball around 15 or 16 feet, but pretty respectable. They draw 12 kilowatts each right now. That's actually the limit we put on them for safety purposes. We are trying to optimize things and take uh, power, but uh, more about that a little later. So to the actual pieces and parts of this thing, start with the secondary, one of my favorite parts of the coil. So this is really beautifully done by a guy named uh, John Porcini. He's actually a homeschooled high school student who's been doing this, I think, longer than any of the people in uh, the team, except maybe Ed, like he's been doing the high energy, high voltage stuff since he was like 14 or 15. And he did this, this uh, secondary coil. It's 12 inch diameter PVC. Uh, it's about six feet long. We had scrubbed it down, cleaned it off really thoroughly, and Ryan wound it with about, you know, 1.4 miles of wire. It's about 21 pounds. It doesn't look like much, but it was a lot of water. It took a long time. And then we cook the whole thing in epoxy <coughs> to prevent arcs from racing up and down. And when this thing gets voltage on, there will be huge voltage screens running along the coil. And if it's not clean, it's not a nice insulating material, we'll get what's called racing arcs up and down the secondary. And that's not good. So this thing's really good. It's, it's all but wonderful. Primary coil. So we use a flat pancake kind of shape, kind of conventional. So this is made from 78 inch outer diameter, three quarter inch inner diameter, uh, tube that you can buy from Home Depot for your refrigerator. Works fine. That's what everyone pretty much uses. Uh, I don't know the actual dimensions of the outer and inner, but one thing that we made sure we did when we made when we designed this is that we didn't fix any taps to it. Taps are what you actually connect the places on the coil. So we actually have fuse clamps that fit perfectly anywhere on the coil. And we just have cables that we can, you know, say I want to tap this part of the coil and then this part of the coil, and that's pretty much our tuning, you know, like you tune an instrument, you get the sound right. We tune our coil, you know, we say, oh, I want to adjust the coupling this way or adjust the linkage inductance this way. That's pretty much what we're doing. So you see just the coil here, but it connects to the rest of the system via some cables you'll see uh, a little bit. And also we can change the height with some plastic standoffs, you couldn't find the picture, but uh, they, that allows us to change the coupling between the coils by lowering or raising. So the top load, uh, we start out with a spherical top load. Um, and sphere, so, like some features of them are nice, they have the best capacitance to volume ratio, um, 
things like that. But the thing about them is you kind of want to project the sparks outward, and spheres distribute their charge uniformly along their uh, surface. And if you put them above an Earth, then it's all going to accumulate on the bottom nearest to you know the Earth potential where all the charge wants to go. And this will cause this crap right here. It'll just go down towards the primary, which is what we don't want because the primary is where all the sensitive, expensive stuff is. You want to project outwards. So they gave long marks, but it was hard to control. It's kind of hazardous. So at some point, we switched over to the toroidal top loads. And toroids are nice. They're kind of just a donut shape. Because when you flatten them out, that means that the charge, which wants to get far from the other charge, will crowd towards the outer rim of the toroid. And that means that your charge will tend to sprout from the edges and go outwards. You can do the you know, FEMM simulations on this and see the nice electrical field shape changing. It works out pretty well. So you can see in this photo, yeah, we're getting the arcs going outward, which is what we want. And it changes the capacitance a little bit. It's a little lower. It raises the uh, operating frequency a little bit. But that's fine. It's just another bit of tuning to take care of. Primary capacitor, the last of the big components. We start out with this guy on the left. It's a big polypropylene uh, tank capacitor made for pulsing uh, energy. You can make lots of cool things out like can pressure and stuff. Not really great for Tesla coils. It doesn't have the RMS current readings. So one thing we're working on right now is replacing that with, with uh, what's called an MMC. It's a multi-mini capacitor array or something, just like tons of smaller capacitors put in an array so we can get exactly the specifications we want. And here you see, I think, something like um, 128 capacitors. I think that is, and these are all going to be one. Actually, that's probably enough for both coils. So that's going to be an array for a new effective capacitor. And we'll probably go for the water current and that'll knock down that bit. That capacitor is the one thing that's kind of holding us back on the tower because it heats up a lot. OK, the h bridge, the driver behind it. This thing is pretty much a monster. It's also, I think, uh, one thing we can say that nobody <coughs> else has anything like this. The only thing that comes close is uh, steam board. We'll talk about later. It's kind of like the, test, the solid state test of coil guy in the world. He has a coil that has four primaries each with their own H bridge. And total, this power is more than this, but no one has an H bridge. That's this uh, sweet. So we have our four CM600 IGBTs, a rate for 600 amps each. We push them over 2,000 amps routinely. And again, because of that soft switching behavior, these are ready to switch hard under 600 amps. You know, switching 0, 600, 0, 600. These go nice sunny sorts, so we can push way above their rate of uh, limits. So four of those on a nice uh, custom machine aluminum water-cooled heat sink. That's really awesome. We never, I think, want this thing on more than a 15 degree C above end. It's ridiculous. Um, and this is all on a laminated bus structure. You can see in the top that this is just basically putting, like our wires are just pieces of deep inch uh, thick copper. So low inductance, low resistance, Current's gonna not have a problem finding a way. And along, around the edge, we have our DC capacitor bank, which is basically storing all the energy that gets delivered to and from the coil. And that's 16 large electrolytic capacitors that <clears throat> totals about 900 volts DC rating, 24 millifarads, about 6,000 joules, I think. So we often, me and Ed used to joke about like calculating how much copper would turn to plasma if we got a short cross laminated bus. It's something like an ounce or something that just sprays out if you get a little burr that sticks between the two insulated layers. So here's some more pictures. You can see uh, on top, it's kind of the yellowest thing. That's actually fiberglass, like the stuff that print circuit boards are made out of. We just got it there. We use that as our insulating layers between uh, the copper layers. So real important for that to be strong. You can see that these tabs sticking down, these are the plus and minus tabs of the DC bus. And these right here are the actual outputs of the h bridge, which connect to the primary. And this, I think, is around when we were trying to get our first light, you know, actually first getting sparks out of it. You see that we have on this kind of cart uh, some control electronics, 
we have, this is the radiator pump and reservoir for the water cooling is totally going to be enclosed, as you see in this step. So next stage is to get this all in a really awesome custom well. This, this frame would work, right? They have everything in there. Yeah, we got bullet by some awesome guys. Is that no one? Uh, uh, no Bill Rabbit. Bill Rabbit. Yeah. Okay. So this this is totally enclosed cooling system. I was skeptical at first, but we've never had a problem. It's pretty awesome. Um, so you can see, but you can see, uh, then this whole guy goes into a shipping crate that has rack nuts on the inside. Again, with uh, what do you call these guys? Rails. Rail, yeah. So they'll slide in. It's pretty heavy, so the, the rails line a bit, but haven't had any problems yet. So, and you can throw this on a boat and ship it across the Atlantic. No problem. Um, and you can see out in the front right here that we have this red cable, a special 25 kilovolt cable we got donated. That was really a big deal for us. And another cable will come up, and the primary will sit right on top of this, and you will actually just kind of clamp on the primary cord. So that's the So how do you actually uh, get this thing to follow directions? So what we have is kind of a, a hybrid design based on Steve Ward's design. He kind of pioneered the whole controlling very large uh, dual uh, resin solid state test of oil thing. We kind of took another step by throwing a microphone on there for telemetry, for saying like, oh, what's our bus voltage? What's our peak primary current? What's our operating frequency? And all comes back over a serial fiber link. And all, all signals going from the coil to the outside world are fiber because nothing else is going to survive the trip in that environment. Um, so this drives the H bridge through what's called a gate drive transformer. It's basically a transformer of one primary and four secondaries. And you connect those four secondaries to the four RGBTs in the H bridge. And if you phase everything correctly, you can just drive the F primary and it'll drive the H bridge with correct phasing and it'll drive the primary. There are some current transformers we built that monitor the primary current. So basically what it does is when you tell it to start oscillating, It'll drive the H bridge in one random direction. Then it'll sit and wait, listen to the primary current until it crosses zero. And then it'll switch the other way at that exact moment. And then wait till it crosses zero, switch. And that's how you get the self oscillating uh, behavior. So this is a closed loop system that goes from this little board. These are kind of, this, this is the sensor that sends the primary current. This is the driver that drives the muscle on that board. And it works pretty well so far. And on the user side of things, that, that board was, was going to be buried inside the H bridge with the coil. Um, on the user side, we need to get the information from the telemetry, you know, all the information about temperature <coughs> and voltage and things like that. So we have a board that basically converts USB serial to fiber uh, UART. And that communicates with the microcontroller. And we have another board. Uh, whose purpose is to hook up, is, is there a, a USB to MIDI converter which plugs into that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks like just a cable. But a little right. Like that chip of yeah, I think like it's some little uh, thing that just converts uh, USB into MIDI. And then we have a microcontroller in there that takes the MIDI and gives the PWM signals to turn the coil on and off at the desired uh, repetition rate. There's also an e stop. This is sending the actual signals of the coils, telling them to fire or not fire. It's having an e stop, which is real important. Every, we have e stops on most pieces of equipment. Um, and also, both of these, I think, they do they usually get plugged in the same computer? Yes. Okay. So they'll go into Chris's MacBook and he'll sit there watching, he'll be playing the audio track and watching our uh, telemetry program, displaying all our data. And ironically, all the hardware we, work, we build works pretty well. MacBook, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, some of it's human error, some of it is you know, spec. We're trying to work on that, not on the MacBook, but on replacing it. So how do we actually, so we can control this thing, but how do we actually you know, give it what it wants? It wants power. This can draw us you know, 10 kilowatts on average, you know, in the normal operation. So we first start out with something a little smaller. What you see on the left, on the bottom are two variacs. 
which, if you don't know what a variac is, basically a variable uh, transformer. They can put an AC voltage and change the turns ratio from one to the from the primary to secondary. And then we just throw those into uh, rectifiers, which convert it to DC. So this is our really cheapo uh, AC to DC converter. But there's no fault protection on that. You just need to throw in a breaker and hope that nothing you know melts before the breaker trips. It's, and also, these are only meant for 30 amps, and that's like only six or seven kilowatts, not very much. Um, and to go along with that, we have this uh, called the Johnny Box, and it's kind of a nightmare on the inside. I won't put you through it. Like, really well routed wire thing here. Only Johnny could do. Um, but there's all the transformers, all the line filters that keeps the electricians, you know, at the power plant from slamming us down, you know by shutting off your generators with EMI and things like that. Um, contains the breaker panel, all the cam locks for the input AC feed, all the hubble connectors for the output DC feed, uh, disconnect, and some switches for controlling our motorized there. Yeah, it's a really great piece of equipment, but we just kind of grew out of it. So what we want to do next is build what's called a PFC, which stands for Power Factor Correction uh, Converter. So it's basically, uh, a better way to turn your AC to DC. It's a switch mode power supply, um, so it has things not like uh, regulation on the output, you can have current limiting, that kind of, kind of stuff. So our first attempt at it with me did not go so well. I had some naive ideas about how, you know, little transistors, not, not little ones, but not big ones, could put 20 kilowatts, you know, from across a barrier. And so you see the aftermath of something like this happens at like four kilowatts, they just can't take it. And they look <coughs> nice aluminum pieces. Um, so this is where uh, John Kasnich steps in. He's the guy talking about who uh, was a case alumni and is now working at Rockwell Automation, the senior engineer up there. And he's the guy who's kind of like, oh, I just found using a stack of thousand dollar IGT in my dumpster after, <laughs> and why don't we try those out? So here comes the muscle. Um, so after doing this, he also <laughs> brought in some of his, like he, he works in a BFD and variable frequency drives for very, very large motors, like 1,000 horsepower motors. So he has these boards that are just like, oh, it's a 12 channel gate driver for inverters or something like that. So we kind of let the design from that build into a control circuit. And we end up with these nice PSCs, which are, which perform pretty well. They're not, you know, but they're meant to basically give the coil what, is, what it wants without pissing off the electricians, you know, and everyone else who gets uh, power from our service. Uh, so it's not like the FCC, it's, uh, FCC is not going to be happy, UL is not going to be happy, but it's efficient, it gets good power factor, and it's safe. So it performs really well. And as we, go, we think up to 20 kilowatts, right now we're limited to 12 just for the sake of the coil. So that'll choose. Um, other issue. One thing about the coils is that they generate insane amounts of EMI, and not just at you know their 30 kilohertz or whatever resonant frequency. When that spark discharges, that arc moves about the speed of light. So you have basically charge moving that fast with drawing 30 uh, with drawing 30 microseconds when the when the current reverses and all kinds of crap is happening as the arc curls and whatever, and you basically end up with noise in every uh, band from, you know, medium frequency of so everything, uh, your DSL modem, everything, your cell phones, your cell phones seem to do okay. Wireless microphones seem to do great for some reason. Bluetooth does okay. But uh, all, the, all the electronics have to get in shields or behind shields. Like here we see Chris's computer uh, sitting behind a uh, screen we built. So this is kind of a folding tabletop screen. There is aluminum mesh all around the outside of that and windows in the front. So you put your laptop in there and it has pretty much, uh, I mean, if you're if the test hole in front of you, there all the electric field lines are going to turn it on that shield instead of on your capacitive touch pad. Which, yeah, <laughs> loves. Um, so, and all cables that are going here and there, you put ferrite chokes on them to prevent common mode currents from jamming with things. You put you know, it, it's just a matter of like, you put a little ferrite here, you put a little copper here to keep things quiet. There are things that I really don't like uh, the Tesla coil. We have a meal here. One is the MacBook. Like, don't plug in 
don't plug into the wall, charge your battery while it's testing while it's going. Because when you create ground loop, then you burn out your power management so you create this. Um, <laughs> and after the end, though, just got the warranty just in time. Yes, yes. Well, yeah, answer the question. As a result of Tesla, my entire computer has been replaced once. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we have insurance. With the, with the exception of the optical drive. And there are other things like uh, when we performed at the, uh, the Sonic Temple, we had lots of problems with their, you know, nice fancy digital amplifiers. You know, we're looking at them, plug it in, and they you know, just can't deal with it. You got to the sitting out. So we have to use things like audio isolation. That's what we call So you have to put isolation back here. Right now, we have, I didn't put it in the slide right here. But uh, we actually made this really sweet circuit that takes <coughs> analog audio, modulates into PWM over a fiber light, and then demodulates it back in the audio. And that pretty much solved the audio link problem. Also, smart lighting, which is basically LEDs controlled over ridiculous digital interfaces. They don't want to get in there. So I think it's a matter of who wires them on. When probes wire or not, you don't get any problems. DSL modems can't handle it. We never could get our streaming web performance going because the DSLs would not work. Also, small enamels. We have uh, <laughs> burned our shared moth. I still think we got that at the house. Okay. Well, yeah. yeah. I didn't find it after the fact, but it was the problem. Um, <laughs> but I don't really have much wildlife on campus, so we're being friendly. But yeah, lots, lots of crap to deal with. So other fun things. So we got Ian's thing in the Faraday suit. It's all aluminum chain. Um, oh, it's, it's stainless steel. Really? Yeah, the first year we tried aluminum and the rings kept popping. Oh, I thought this one was aluminum. That's why we were able to stand for more than 10 minutes. Oh, it's just like very fine, very fine stainless steel. All right. Well, stainless steel, isn't it lighter than the steel? Uh, it's slightly lighter than the steel. OK, it's still heavy. Like, is it 40 pounds? I think 40 pounds. Yeah. So, yeah, or he jumps around a bit, but I couldn't do that. Um, so and this was designed especially, like, was it was designed for linemen or for actual like, Tesla so this, coil? This was designed for a Tesla coil. Yeah. There's a couple other groups that do Tesla coil stuff in the world, and this was designed for one in California called KVA Effects. Right, that, okay, I was wondering if that was actually. They paid six grand. We bought it used for, for 1500 Can we turn it into the passenger or something? I tried to. Um, <laughs> that's our best currency. We have lots of things. So we also wear the layer. Uh, I remember you were having problems with still getting uh, racing arts, I think, down your skin. So there's still a layer of insulation. But Faraday laws isn't perfect. You still get uh, some charge over on the inside of the suit. So you wore rubber gloves, long sleeves, long pants, everything. And I still haven't figured out the aluminum <laughs> headband. You swear it works. Yeah. Yeah. So to keep the fuzzies off your head, it's just make a little tin foil head. Yeah. 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 And then there's a mask, which I've seen on my ears. <laughs> <laughs> but they got burned last time, so got to make fun of this. And there's a fairy cage, which we built for fun. Um, yeah, that's from John F. Yeah. So this is uh, Ian trying it the first time. I'm standing off to the left, you know, fighting my nails. When he's gonna draw. But it works. There is a lot of work here. So that's, uh, it's polycarbonate, all yeah, around. Polycarbonate plastic with welded rabbit fence. Is yeah. The, the steel PG part. Right. So the only worry of really with this uh, is actually, if someone just freaks out while they're in there and tries to burst their way out, I mean, getting out of the out of thing is a lot more dangerous than staying in. So we actually have to kind of lock them in with a few latches. You gotta, you gotta, I can still pick my way out of there. So we've got to put some little latches on there. But I think so, and if they were in the given moment, stare, uh, stare out of it because they can. <coughs> but that works great. It's, uh, we use this at the, uh, the uh, temple show, and it's, uh, it gets hot in there. That's, I think, our, was the main complaint for people in there. But otherwise, it needs more arrows. Yeah, good crowd cooler. So, in the, that's kind of where we're at now. Those are what, that's what we've got. 
future goals. We've got some big ideas. I personally want to see the, the uh, coil reach its you know, maximum potential. Like when I do my calculations on saying how much can the H bridge handle, it's like even hard to come up with a number because we so barely scratch the surface between like 15 and 100 kilowatts. <laughs> And that's a factor of three or four more than anyone's done before. So we want to slowly inch our way up there, you know. I'd, I'd like to get 20 kilowatts with the TSC then. Of course, we've got to get the capacitor, we got to get the control board, you know, and move on. So there's, there's lots of things to be done. Um, we also, the one of the nice things about uh, the higher power isn't mainly about getting bigger sparks, it's about increasing your audio band. Because if you go, if I go back to the slide where you see the actual audio pulsing. Each one of those pulses is a discrete packet of energy, so your power consumption is pretty much proportional to your tone frequency. You want to play up an octave, you double your power. The volume goes up a bit as well, but it's really just, you know, if you want to play high notes, you pay for it. So if we can get our bandwidth up, then we also think we can do things like multi uh, or polyphonics, playing chords on one coil. There are things you can do, you know, you get into some kind of mathy stuff to try and change the timbre of your coil and stuff like that. There's a, there's a lot of ideas we've got, but right now we have to build the coils to handle that much power, you know, handle two notes at once, and also work on the kind of controller software side to actually see, you know, can we actually do this in real time to help the signals do, you know, Fourier transforms and liquid transforms and stuff like that. Also, people have, you know, ideas about the show, we want to add more elements to the performance. Johnny's, I don't know if the arcade is still going on about the fire or anything, but that's one idea they got to tuck up with some instead of basically, yeah, I'm working for the fire. <laughs> if someone else has done it, but like they're, they want like a real, real size board and they bought the pipes like the door. Mm -hmm. um, also, we wanted, I think we were talking about either yeah, yeah, uh, hiring a court out of her, or hiring another dancer or another series. So we're all we're all branching out into the technical side of things. That's more my domain. And you can probably tell us more about the uh, actual performance side of things. Sure. What I'd love to do is go into the realm of illusions and magic. There are other Tesla coil groups out there in the world. Steve Moore has one called Moments of Lightning or something like that in Chicago. There's a group in Austin, Texas called Art Attack. There's a group in Australia, there's a group in England, there's a group in California called KJSX. So to distinguish ourselves, to find our own niche, I want to move into illusions, gigantic illusions of lightning bolts. Um, and uh, we recently had a, an audition for a TV show on NBC called America's Got Talent. And that was what I pitched to them in New York, was the idea that we're going to bring illusions to the show. This is our niche and that's what distinguishes us. Um, if we do get on the show, they provide, in case may also help, a production budget so we can finally actualize some of the performance ideas that we've written up and talked about um, over the past, I guess, three years. We're three years into the project now. Yeah. So hopefully, magic, magical lightning bolts. That could be the future. Yeah. So, so, just to wrap up, so if you're at all interested in this kind of stuff, and you want a testicle, there are tons of ways to put this stuff. It's like, you know, reading Wikipedia for hours and hours. It's like you can crush yourself, you can tear yourself apart or whatever. Um, but generally, I, I recommend going not to certain websites, but to certain people who have survived long enough to actually <laughs> do not go to the forums. Do not go to the forums, because other people who are basically, you know, Short list of ways to die. Uh, and they're the ones who we do get emails about, so they're the cautionary tales. Um, so, people like, uh, well, first off, there's our website. We have a website, and you can go there, find, you can go on an email list where we'll give you, you know, a few updates a year. We're not going to expand you or anything. Just basically on events that are coming on, you know, in or around Cleveland or if we're going abroad. Or whatever. And if you want to actually join up, with uh, the group while we were talented engineer and get in contact with Ian. And I gave him the, uh, I mean, give him the email. Yeah. Yeah. So you can, you can write my email on the board. Yeah. Is it ICC? Yeah. Well, we'll forward it now, I think. 
Yeah. Yeah, we can do that. Right, right. So just because people want to come. And uh, apart from no, yeah, we have a YouTube channel. I think we have, you know, Twitter and Facebook. And yeah, if you want to actually look at what other people are doing, pretty uh, big name in this. I mentioned Steve Moore a couple of times. He kind of developed the uh, dual resin sulfate Tesla coil, popularized it. Right now, he's kind of retreating to his lab doing other crazy stuff. And Tesla coils and also general high voltage, high energy stuff, like crushing quarters, you know, things like that. Very cool stuff. Richie Burnett uh, does more with a very large spark. Yeah, Tesla coils. Like those are the ones that shoot out 26 foot arcs, and you um, have to operate in the middle of the field. Like, <laughs> um, and there is Antonio Carlos de Cuevas, and he's a, a Spanish electrical engineering professor who basically does his research on testing things. And he has done all of them. And it's, it's, you take a transformer and two capacitor, and you will write you know, six pages of equations to define all the possible modes that test the well and occupy which ones are optimal. You know, you know, if you want to punish yourself, go ahead. Okay. One, one uh, warning though, all these sites look like they're written in like 1995. They're not good weapons. So you have to you know, the crafting and stuff. And that's all I got. Uh, just one final comment. If anybody is interested in joining the Tesla Orchestra, there's an open membership. Right now, I think all the, almost all the spots are filled by K students. Sometimes they're CA students or alumni or staff. I'm a staff member here now, uh, running the think class. Um, but give me an email. My email is icc at case.edu. Hopefully you capture it, or Ed or somebody can send that out to the yeah. list Yeah, we can send that out. Uh, and just send me a note, tell me you're interested, a little bit about yourself. We'll schedule a conference. No, but we're a fun group. We have a lot of fun. And uh, we get to go on trips to Europe and maybe Egypt. And, Wonder, we'll see what happens. Well. All right, thanks for that comment. Okay. Yeah, question, quick question. Um, it seems like from the presentation you can just use MIDI files to trigger the file. Right. So you never like use the MIDI device like to perform the vibe, perform the MIDI device? Like the MIDI Right. So the G. So the coils are just triggered by an on-off signal, which is derived from the MIDI. MIDI is just commands, but yeah, we can play MIDI over the audio, over the audio track. So I think we did that that first when we were starting out. Yeah, right. we did the over on the back. Yeah, the first year we used the keyboard and we had a line of position. <laughs> oh yeah, MIDI by MIDI. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 We'll have yeah. that yeah. Care, uh, capability all over the first. It's easy to show that. Oh, I have the previous row. Yeah, just pass it around. So I ask, I'm looking yeah. for some more burnt out IGBT, you know, and there's MIDI in both hands. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Don't change that jumper. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. I mean, there's a lot of custom circuit design that goes in, in here, a lot of analog and digital, so I can play guys. Uh, one of the new, new soundboard has an FPGA, an ARM uh, <laughs> processor, uh, like, it's kind yeah. of ridiculous. Uh, he finished building it and he didn't test any of it before he finished building it. He hasn't covered it up. Yeah, that was for me. He has? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. First thing he did was get the voltage regulated on there and check the process. Then he told me to program it, then he finished copying it. Okay. I'm going to be one short and he's never going to So, yeah. If you're into the electronic or into the power side of things, I'm more into the power side of things, so though. I spend my time on the control because that's kind of where my skill set is. Uh, what kind of audio waveform do you get out? Because I mean, like, it sounds like square waves, basically. So for a while, well, we, we neglected putting off doing, you know, the rigorous math. But I'm pretty sure in the time domain, what you get out is something like so I, I want to include this in a uh, presentation, but I know I have time. This is a really good way uh, to kind of s explain why the Tesla coil sounds the way it does. You know, <laughs> sounds like crap, kind of, you know. Like you expect 
a stereotypical electronic thing to the sound. And that's because, like I said, it delivers energy in sharp packets. So what you have is this uh, secondary voltage that goes like this. And your power is basically this squared. So you get kind of, like if this is zero, and this kind of averages out to that. And then a spark happens here, and your actual heat in the air goes like that. It's, that's like your your audio waveform looks like that. Do the time. It's going to be something like that. It's basically the equivalent of a class C amplifier in analog, where you're biased in a completely off region, and when you want to drive a signal, <coughs> you turn it on hard. So that gives very efficient operation because you're only driving it when you actually want to make sound, but it has tons of distortion because. You clip the waveform and everything, and it's just hard to make music. We can't really alter this waveform. You can't control the spark. It does what it wants. But there are other types of Tesla coils where you can finally modulate them. You might have seen them. We'll call them plasma speakers or plasma tweeters, where you actually, uh, if you go back to the original solid state Tesla coil, so I said these operate in continuous wave mode. So if you just drive one of these continuously, and modulate its power supply, what you can do is say, like, if you modulate its DC power supply like this, you'll get kind of a output power that kind of tracks that. And you'll get the envelope of that will be a nice sign of it. And you can actually make pretty high fidelity audio, like, like audio files seem to have the fetish of you know, massless speaker or something. Like um, <laughs> But well, they pay money for them, so why not make them? But anyways, like this is nice, very low distortion. The thing is, now you're driving the coil all the time. You have to bias the coil into an on state. This is like the class A amplifier, which even when you're not playing anything, sits there and gets you know ridiculously hot. Whatever dull with amplifiers, that's how they are. So this has the high audio fidelity, but it's horribly inefficient. Like I factor a hundred, getting the sound out of that is. You know, it's pretty much real. I actually have some recordings. Oh, yeah, he, he did take this. So, is this an FFT? Yeah, that's FFT. Okay, so that's a sound. Can you see it? Well, and the fundamental, the thing I was playing is not the strongest there. Right. That's the only thing to know. Right. That's why our bass notes sound really crappy at the time. So, what, what is it supposed to be? Is it, uh, is there a 90 Four, is, it? is it 440? No, I, I, uh, I'm not sure. You, you have to, you have to listen to it. Perfect. Oh, oh yeah. Well, you have to. Oh, this is a mail line, isn't it? No, no it's not. Uh, you want that? Uh, oh, I can do that. Yeah. So this is all the analysis that should go into this if we want to, you know, kind of break barriers and make actual music you know, as much as we can. So there's no way you're going to get high fidelity audio, but you can maybe change the timbre, make it sound like you can make maybe sound like two different instruments, maybe a mellotron on one side <laughs> and a synth on the other in order. This is what uh, this is what it sounds like. There's no form. That's okay. So that's what the hundred. Mm, yeah, yeah, hundred hertz. So so. In the time domain, it looks like adoption. It looks like this. <laughs> right, you you see the lag? So messy. Yeah. Yeah, that is almost noise. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's what it looks like in the frequency domain. Because you can, your ears are really amazing. They can hear that fundamental. Clear. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually came up with the idea a while back that if we uh, alternately pulse the two coils, like you get feed one 500 hertz, the other 500 hertz, 90 degrees out of phase, you get 1,000 hertz and you break, your ears can, you know, say like, no, that's, that's 500 hertz on each of us. Screw that. This is what doesn't work with problem. Yeah. Right. That's when we were, I was wondering what the heck was going on. I want to see what it actually looks like and it looks like that. But your ears can make a wonderful sense out of it. It's amazing. So that's part of the project too. Is where you know you can do the math you want, but how's your ears interpret that? That's totally different. Deal. So that's 
start reading this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Good presentation, man. Right. I'll stick around if anyone has any more questions. Otherwise, that's good.